uh, I will talk about each uh, step in ETL which is extraction, transformation. The three steps involved in ETL is extraction, transformation and loading. If you ask me personally, I would like to insert another small V between E and T which is called validation. In real life uh, project scenarios, we have uh, data validations also. So it's uh, actually E small V T L. So it's extraction, validation of the data, transformation of the data and loading. So we'll be discussing in detail about all these processes. With this, let's move on to our first slide which is to introduce what exactly is ETL. So as I said, we discussed a lot about uh, OLTP and OLAP systems in our previous sessions. So OL OLTP, as I told before, is online transaction processing system, which is your transaction system, day-to-day -day transaction system, which notes, which uh, records data for every transaction, every small movement which is happening uh, in your uh, in your enterprise. So your transaction system stores data in a very detailed level. But your OLAP system, which is your reporting system, could um, might not need data at detail level, but probably at a uh, aggregated level or a, or you can call it as highlights or important highlights. And you might have, uh, as, as we know that uh, we might uh, have a selective uh, OLAP system, like we want to do uh, reporting on on only certain data from your OLTP system, system, not all of it. So, so you do you use ETL to get the data from that uh, detailed OLTP system and bring it into the format you want in the OLAP system, and uh, this process of bringing o, uh, the data in OLTP to OLAP system, the data, the process involved is called ETL in which you actually transform the data, uh, extract the data first from your OLTP system, then you, you transform the data in the format you want and then you load it into your OLAP system. So, so why, why exactly you need ETL in between? Why can't you just take the data and copy and paste it in the OLTP system or oh, take the data from OLTP system and paste it in the OLAP system. So the data as you know is not really very simple or always very, very available. So you have to perform certain kind of transformations and calculations to get the data in the desired format. So that's why we have something called ETL. So and also it could be, as I said, that OLTP system has so much data and OLAP system just needs uh, certain data which is necessary for doing the, uh, necessary for doing your uh, day to, taking your day to day strategical decisions. So, so that is ETL, extracting, uh, getting the data in your desired format from your OLTP system not only one system could be multiple OLTP systems, file systems or anything. So that process is called ETL. So as we know also that uh, the data warehouse, one of the property of the data warehouse is it is subject oriented. Okay, before we go into it, I would want to tell, uh, I'll tell something about ETL, right? It's ETL is not the process of loading only data warehouse. So in this uh, session or in this uh, in this uh, tuto in this uh, course we'll be talking only about loading data warehouse but it doesn't mean that anything any other data migration project this uh, ETL term is not used ETL is used for all the all the projects whether it would be a data warehousing project or it's just a data migration project from one OLTP system to another OLTP system it's all called ETL wherever you have extraction of data transformation of data and loading of data, it's called ETL. So this, in this context of this course, we'll be discussing about loading our data warehouse. So that's why here we are talking ETL in, in perspective of loading a data warehouse. So as we know, our data warehouse is a subject-oriented uh, system where you have data which is, which is uh, very, which is very specific to the subject you want to 
uh, see your reports on. So, so getting the data from the OLTP system, selective data from the OLTP system and loading into these different uh, specific subject oriented data warehouse is, uh, is ne to do this it, uh, we have to use ETL. So, so this is one of the reasons why why ETL is used and so to get the data from OLAP which is uh, which is a which is a varied system has data for everything and anything happening in your system to a very subject oriented OLAP system we need a, we need a uh, we need to perform ETL on the data so this uh, diagram you see in this slide which shows there is a OLAP system from where you are you have two subject oriented OLAPs which is uh, one OLAP is employee subject oriented employee oriented and another one is customer oriented so in this uh, so you are doing performing ETL on the OLAP system and getting it, getting them into two different uh, subject oriented OLAP systems so that's what this slide shows that data can be extracted from same OLAP and loaded into two different subject oriented OLAPs sorry uh, yeah so in this case yeah, they are not showing uh, OLTP system but uh, OLAP to OLAP uh, ETL. So, as I said, ETL is not only loading the data warehouse, it could be other data transformations. Like in this case, there is an organization enterprise data warehouse from where you are creating data marts, which is subject specific, employee and employee OLAP and customer OLAP systems. Uh, you are putting data into these two subject oriented data warehouses or data marts. And, uh, one more issue uh, while uh, with the OLTP system is uh, the data which you are expecting in your OLAP system might not uh, the data which is present in the OLTP system might not be in the format which is desired in the data warehousing system. So this process of getting your data from one format to another format that means you are changing the format of the data or doing any uh, doing certain kind of transformation or uh, homogenization of the data to get it into a desired format is all uh, this is also called ETL right so you have multiple source system one is a uh, one is a mainframe system another one is a file system maybe the date format in your file system is different from the date format in your uh, mainframe system so you get homogenize the data from different uh, systems in different formats and getting it to a uh, perform ETL process on that convert it into a certain format desired for your data warehouse so the examples which they show in this slide is like phone number which is a uh, 10 digit number so this is another example which is uh, for data anomaly one example which I said is it is not in proper format uh, across different system another one is you could have data anomalies like uh, as, as we discussed there could be data defects like you want a phone number to be of the example they are showing here is you want a phone number to be of 10 digits but in your one of your source system you only have five digits or your email address is not in a correct format so all these data has to be cleansed so cleansing process is done in your ETL ETL process so one is to homogenize the data second is to cleanse the data and uh, and uh, yeah so and also as I said that to combine two different systems there couldn't be so if uh, the example I gave like we have a mainframe system and a file file system so in these two uh, systems there might not be any interaction there might not be a common ground where you can perform or have a centralized data data where centralized master data which is accessed by both systems so to to get these data together or to combine the data from these source systems you need a ETL tool to get the data from different systems and combine it in the data warehouse since you don't have a common platform so ETL is also used to consolidate data from different systems. Okay, so basically, as I said, uh, while 
data is very complicated in certain systems. The application could be of various complexities. So there are a lot of challenges which you face during your ETL process or designing your ETL process. The complexity of a ETL process basically depends on the type of source systems you are using, uh, source systems you are extracting the data from. And uh, whether it's a file system or is it a mainframe system or is it a complex uh, SAP system from where you are extracting data. So depending on the type of system, the complexity of the ETL will increase and also the number of sources you have or various locations you are the sources from. So all these, uh, these, this is one of the challenge depending on the source system. There could be also complexities because of the uh, loading slot you have for your data warehouse. So ETL process, right, is, uh, is a process which gets the data from one system and loads into another system. So this particular process certainly takes some time. Data transformation from various systems could take uh, like a, they have seen jobs which run for like 12 hours, 15 hours, even 5 days. ETL jobs run for 5 days. But in a data warehouse there could be timeline constraints that you have only 2 hour slot. So this uh, 2 hour slot to load your data warehouse, so maybe in the night time or uh, maybe in off, off hours, daily uh, daily office uh, after office hours or something like that. So if you have such stringent timelines to load your data warehouse, this brings adds to the complexity of the ETL design. So you have to design jobs which have very good performance to come into that slot. So this adds to your challenges. So another another complexity is your uh, data load process. So say if you have a huge SAP system and you have a huge mainframe system which is like which has uh, data for last 40 years. Mainframe systems are very old so they, they could have data for like 60 years, 70 years. So these systems uh, will have huge data. So the way in which you extract data from the system also adds the adds to the complexity. Like if you have such huge systems, you cannot keep extracting all the data every time. You have to perform incremental load to your data. So doing an incremental load to this old system might not be very simple. It could be that uh, these systems do not have proper uh, dates being captured for the transactions or maybe does not have dates all across all its tables or a lot of uh, reasons why extracting incremental load from your source systems becomes complex. So design of your source system, of uh, the way in which the source system stores the data also adds to the complexity. Also, also doing these kinds of load every, every other day or every month, we have to keep into account that we are not, uh, have, we don't bring in data redundancy in our data warehouse. So that is data duplication. So we we don't want duplicate data being extracted from your source system and then getting loaded two times, three times in your data warehouse which could give you wrong reports or which would give you wrong aggregates. So this also adds on to our uh, complexity. And uh, obviously yeah, as I told because of uh, how complex your data warehouse is also determines how long it takes to load. Say you you have a very normalized data warehouse so and then you have millions of records being loaded into your data warehouse and you maintain your data warehouse in an hourly basis. So if you have a very been a very normalized data warehouse then loading these systems is more complex. So it also depends on your data warehouse design, the challenges you face. Basically this loading uh, increases when in this case we are talking about data warehouse which will be a database basically. So in this the complexity could be the data model. But there are, if you talk not talk about data warehouse and you talk about other applications like uh, SAP loading uh, SAP applications or any other Oracle applications then you also would have to pass through the application layer. You cannot directly load into SAP system. 
or a oracle system you have to pass through their application layer which will add on to the loading so i have seen jobs which run uh, load into sap which loads for ever like 6 days 7 days the loading period is so long so even the loading data model the target data model determines your complexity of the complexity or loading time of the etl process so with all this the summary of the etl process or etl designing a etl process is first you have to determine you have to determine what data you need as i said there is so much data in oltp system you have to be selective what you need for your target system so you have to first find out what data you need from your sources and you have to so basically this what data also specifies which system you are going to extract you could have multiple oltp system in your source but my, you might not have to touch all the source system so you have to decide which source you want to extract the data from and then you have to once you decide which source system then you have to decide how to extract the data from which how to extract the data whether you want to do incremental load or you want to do uh, you want to do full load full extraction or whatever whatever kind of extraction you want to do then after that comes after extracting the data you need to decide on your harmonization rules like how to harmonize data between these two systems which are called cleansing rules or you uh, and also transformation rules maybe you are converting certain format of data from one format to another format we will be discussing more about uh, data transformations and i will provide more examples but so this is the third part first you decide what data second you decide which source third you decide what kind of uh, extraction methods and transformation that uh, rules you are going to use last but not the least is the loading what how are, how are you going to load your data where are you going to load your data which dimensions how do you design your load jobs to load dimensions and facts in our perspective of data warehousing so that's the overall etl process and uh, how to design an etl process but let's look into each steps of etl one by one so i will just uh, i as i told you before in this etl there are three processes the extraction transformation and loading but after the extraction um, generally in uh, real life scenarios you have something called validation but it's not af always after extraction you could have validation after your your uh, there are preload validations which is before loading the data or you can have post load validation or you can have since validation after uh, after your data extraction so you can just validate the data to check if everything is fine so this is this is a term validation data validation which we use in real life scenario which which is not the discussed much on much in the slides but i want to emphasize that it is it has got very uh, important stand in this etl you have loaded you have extracted you have uh, you have transformed the data but how do you know when you have done it correctly so this uh, data validation is performed in each after every step or you can choose to do it whenever you want after loading the system or however you want to do it so okay so that's about validation right so now we let's discuss about each steps of etl extraction transformation and loading one by one <clears throat> so data extraction as i said uh data extraction depends basically on your uh on the complexity of your source on the type of extraction you have to do on your source like for example you have one oltp system maybe it's a simple oltp system and you you have analyzed the system you know the data model how to extract the desired data then you have to only figure out what to extract It might not be so much about harmonizing the data or homogenizing the data across different systems so so in this case you have one system and then you just extract and load however you want but if you have multiple system it 
you have to follow certain extraction strategies so that you extract the data at the right time from each systems and various different complexities multiple sources brings in and it could be that these source systems are available at different times so you have to see how you extract so as i told before if you have multiple systems the uh, data extraction strategy has to be different from when you have one system also as i said that uh, those old mainframe systems might not have uh, might not maintain the change data capture we will discuss about change data capture in later slides but what exactly it means that uh, the systems might not be built to identify the changes in the system so you might have to extract everything and then compare with what is already loaded and then load it into your data warehouse so it totally depends on your uh, source systems your extraction strategy mainly depends on your source systems Con Okay, so they are saying that in this, uh, in this, just giving an example, if we have a old banking system, it has a mainframe, uh, mainframe system in the back end. So mainframe systems is very difficult to connect because of security reasons and various different reasons. So they generally have file systems where they load the, extract the files, and drop it there, and the ETL data will, uh, and the ETL tool will access those file systems and extract the data. So, so it, that's what it, basically they are just saying that if it is, uh, it, the extraction strategy depends largely on the type of source we have. And uh, also, as I discussed before, the extraction also depends on the type of the uh, data extraction. Uh, type of, uh, sorry, type. Of the OLTP system, uh, as I discussed, that uh, it depends also on the data, the way in which the data is stored in the system, like whether they are capturing the changes or they are storing only current data or they are storing historical data. So it totally depends on how the data is stored in your OLTP system. Uh, also, your extraction also depends on how the data is stored in the system. So in this example, they are showing that there is a person 12345 is his ID and there is another person 12346. So this system actually uh, has a, for 12345, they have captured the history of the person. Like he lived in Canada in May 2000 and then he shifted to Shifted to New York in June 2001, and then he moved to London in uh, on 5th of. Sorry, so he stayed in Canada till 1st of May, stayed in New York till 5th of June, and then from the June to until now he is living in London. And another person is living in California. Uh, lived in California up till September 2002, and now he is living in Fran Francisco. So this information is stored in a system. So the extraction strategy will depend on whether your source system actually has the history of the data or not. So so the approach one which we they are discussing here is based on if the source system only stores the current information. So if you see this example here, the data stored at certain point in time only stores one information of that so at this moment, the first uh, first uh, table you see, the person one two three four five stayed in Canada, and the second person one two three four six stayed in California. But after uh, after some time, the data got updated in the OLTP system, and it became New York and San Francisco. Similarly, uh, after the third update, it became London and uh, San Francisco. So the way, so you see in your extraction, in your source system, you don't really have the history maintained. So you won't get the history of the person if you miss miss one of these uh, timelines. So you have to understand the system 
and if you want to maintain history in your data warehouse you have to decide on your extraction extraction strategy if you don't want to miss uh, miss this slot of changes so so that is about how the data is stored in your system approach 2 is the same uh, approach 2 is also based on how the data is stored but in this case the system actually your OLTP system actually stores the uh, history of the person so that is called change data capture so in your OLTP system entire history of that person is stored so you see the table here uh, one, two, three, four, five. The person moved from Canada to New York, and then New York to San Francisco. So this data is actually stored in your uh, stored in your uh, source system itself. So every time you have to, you don't want to extract everything of the person. You just want to extract the changes which happened to that person, right? So that identifying the changes which happen to a particular record is called as change data capture. So generally in the newer systems you have time stamps. so you can just do extract your data first uh, initial load generally you extract everything from your source system then in the subsequent loads you might extract data based on the timestamp associated with your record but uh, in the older systems you might not have this facility you might not have the change data capture implemented in the systems so in that case you need to extract everything and then compare it with what you have already and then you have to decide what is the delta and then load that delta into your data warehouse. So there are uh, advantages and disadvantages in these cases like if you have change data capture in your source system itself then it's an extra, um, extra burden on your source system but if you extract whole data every time then it's a burden on your side so it depends on the type of the type of extraction depends on uh, again on your OLTP system how and how the data is stored. Uh, so extraction jobs right basically are um, if you are extracting from OLTP systems those are production systems right or your OLTP systems are basically your transaction systems where your day to day transactions are, tra transactions are happening like say it is a ba banking system. So if you have a banking system like that and then you perform your extraction during V hours when people do uh, people do their daily transactions and your because of that uh, your extraction the performance of the system might go down and then maybe somebody's ATM transaction just failed because you were putting heavy load on the OLTP system. So basically you cannot uh, in real life scenarios you cannot do an extraction on production system on like any time you want. There has to be scheduled jobs as this statement says. Usually jobs are scheduled during off peak hours to capture the data from the OLTP system and prepare the set of files. So what they mean to say is that in those old systems uh, like main frames I said they will spit out files from the systems on a scheduled basis when this is off peak hours they will decide it based on their OLTP system performance they will come up with certain times when they have data from these systems and put it in the files for the ETL jobs to run. So the scheduling of the jobs either based on a certain timeline say every day I run my job 1 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m. in the morning and then your ETL job finishes 2 hours so before everybody is your data warehouse is up to date and ready for people to use and your transaction system is up and running and nobody is disturbing your transaction system. So you have to schedule your job either based on certain timelines or you can base it on files being delivered from the system so your ETL job can keep polling for input file. The input file comes in, as soon as the input file comes in then your job starts and then loads the data warehouse. So that is also possible or you can schedule it based. So this was about extraction. 
in a data warehousing process or a data warehousing system, 70 to 80 percent of the data transformation happens in ETL. So there is very less data transformation happening after ETL that is in your OLAP system or after your OLAP system is created. There could be a little bit ETL happening. Uh, not ETL, I would say little bit processing happening in your uh, OLAP uh, before generation of the report. So what I basically want to say is that, so this ETL actually covers a huge space in the data warehouse uh, data processing uh, data processing logic. So maximum data processing is done in these three steps, extraction, transformation and loading. So, so with this extraction, so this is transform transformation as the name just is basically transforming the data to the desired format. So it could any kind of data transformation, bringing the data, like say bringing the data to a certain format in which you need, like say you have different date formats like in different source systems. One source system could store DDMMYY, another source system could store the date in DD, MM, YYYY with time and everything. So you have to bring, you have to decide on a certain format which you want in your data warehouse and bring all the data from disparate sources to that particular format. So that is called transforming the data. You are changing the data from one form to another. And uh, also these systems uh, could also have uh, different kind of data types like file will have everything in string format. Your mainframes will have uh, some weird uh, data types like uh, your uh, oracle system could have float, your, uh, your uh, teradata system could have like uh, double or I don't know. Different, they have different nomenclature and different properties. So you have to bring all of them into a homogenized map of data types to the format you need in your data warehouse. Say your data warehouse is Oracle, so you bring all the data types to certain Oracle format. Or also, if the like in this example, they are showing that in your source system you have name of hundred hundred character. You can store name only hundred character. Uh, uh, you store your name in length of 100 character, but in your warehouse you only need 50 characters. So you have to come up with a certain logic to not lose the data and keep the uh, name. Or maybe this uh, truncation of name doesn't matter too much to the business. So you just change the data type from where care 100, care 100 to where care. In this case, you see that a data type is changing from CAR 100 to where CAR. The difference in this data type in database, I think Somina will know better. The CAR 100 is something which fixes the memory in the database to 100, even if you use that space or not. So, in a trans, uh, so as soon as you define a data type as 100, even if you store name of five characters, it will occupy the same memory space. But where CAR is something which will shrink and increase based on the data which is stored. So if the day, name is five character length, it will, in physical memory, it will only occupy five character. And if it is uh, 50 character, it will occupy 50. So in this case, the there is the CAR to where CAR, you are actually saving space based on your data which is stored in the data type. in the in the database, physical database. So this, these are few scenarios where you might need data transformations. And also, yeah, so as we said that you could have different sources, right? So joining these two sources also is a kind of transformation, like getting the sources, harmonizing the data, getting source uh, data from multiple sources. Data model of one OLTP system could be completely different from another OLTP system. So you bring it to a, both the system to a certain format. In, in general, uh, in a real life scenario, we call some, when I, if you ask me when I am supposed, when I'm given a job to design a data warehouse, 
the first thing I will come up uh, for extraction purpose, uh, sorry, in a data warehouse process, in an ETL process, if I'm asked to design an ETL process, and then they tell me these are my sources. So the first thing I will come up with uh, something called DCT, which is uh, in real, uh, the full form of DCT is data collection template. So I will come up with this uh, set of fields and the formats which I want to bring all the source system data to. I call it as uh, data collection template. So I will, what I will do is I will get all the source system data which is in different formats to that particular format before I do any kind of transformation on it. So this is also uh, certain kind of transformation, bringing data to that format you need. So that is a kind of transformation and there could be mul like numerous uh, type of transformations. Like in the example they are showing, there is a source system which has uh, two fields. One is f uh, a first name and then the another field is uh, last name which is both char 20 and in your data warehouse you need only, you have only one field which is name. So you have to concatenate these two fields to get them into one field. So this is another type of transformations. And also they could, there is another uh, uh, very, uh, very common transformation you do is to bring all the codes of different data coding codings of different system into one system. Say your one of your OLTP system stores gender, for example, in the format male and female. But in another OLTP system, the same gender value is stored as M and F. Another source system could store one and zero. So there could be multiple ways in which data is stored. Uh, the data is coded in different system. This is called data coding. So you have to bring all these codes to a homogeneous code format. So you have to convert all ones and zeros to M and F and all male and female to M and F. The one which has uh, M and F, you leave them as it is. So this is another kind of transformations. And uh, there is a there is very interesting kind of uh, data transformation or we do. Uh, I, I haven't seen it very common in ETL scenarios, but there is one thing we in new systems we have started doing. From certain source system, but it is not complete. So there is, uh, there are sub, uh, services available, uh, global services like even Google provides the service where you can complete your address. Say right now Google has for America. So if your source system only has postal code and your data warehouse needs the whole address, you can actually use the postal code, use this geo, uh, geo database from Google or geo service from Google and then you can actually populate all the fields. So this is also kind of transformation. This is something very interesting I have seen in my current project. So we are doing a geo call to complete the data. So this is uh, this is using external sources to complete your data. So this is also kind of transformation. And uh, yeah, so in your data warehouse, you could you are not doing a direct map, right? You are not all getting the data in the same format. Your granularity, which we talked about before, from your NTP system to your target system, might not be this uh, might not be the same. You you might be getting the data to aggregated. Uh, you are maybe you are performing certain calculations on your data, or you are uh, bringing the granularity from low to high or high to low, however, you cannot bring it from high to low, but you have to get it from low to high. So that means you have data at daily level, you might get it to hourly, uh, sorry, uh, from daily to monthly, uh, monthly to yearly. So this kind of aggregation to your data uh, is also called as transformation. So bringing the data to the desired granularity in your target database. So the example they are showing here is, the sales data of a supermarket chain may be calculated at month level based on individual transaction from source. 
the number of policies an agent has sold per state per month can be calculated. So, so they are saying that the source system has individual transaction, everyday transaction. So, but they are summarizing the data per. So, yeah, they are grouping the data into per state, that is per, per uh, province, per month. So, the profit percentage uh, similarly can be calculated on quarterly basis. So, basically they are just saying that they are aggregating the data and um, calculating data based on your source data to match the uh, granularity of your target system. Mm, yeah, so I, we already discussed about all this, the uh, business rules. It could be any kind of business rules you want to apply on your data. like. Uh, as I said that you want to get the data to certain format based on certain coding, data coding system you have. You can apply different uh, business rules like you combine two different names together. Everything that business needs to see in the final target data warehouse is called a business rule. So the example they are giving is they have a rule. Okay, so this business rule is basically to filter out the data or or uh, to select the data. So, this in this rule they are saying that uh, this one department uh, should not have more than one manager. So, this is basically validation they are performing. So, if, uh, if they have more than one uh, department, uh, more than one manager for one department, then they would probably reject the record or filter out the record or they will send it to a data companies to do error correction or whatever. So these kind of checks, data validation perform. Also kind of transformation, but I would rather call them data validations than transformations because you are not really transforming the data. Basically you are filtering, if you are actually changing your data set, you had 100 records, but because of this rules, your record reduced to 90. That is kind of transform transformations, uh, reducing the data set or changing the data set you had. So this is kind of transformation. A parent-child relationship mean, uh, like we discussed, the integrity checks, right? So when you are extracting from an OLTP system, you might be extracting from multiple tables to get your data collection complete, right? So, when you are extracting from this OLTP data model, you might have to maintain the integrity between these two tables. So, if you are extracting one table, you should make sure that you extract another table also, so that your integrity between the data you are forming is correct. So, that's I think all about uh, data transformation. Okay, let's uh, see the example they are giving. So, the example they are giving for parent-child relationship to be maintained is record cannot be loaded into table B as long as the record is not. Okay, so they are giving loading example. I gave you extraction example, right, for maintaining parent-child relationship. So, in this case, they are saying that while loading into your target data warehouse, you need to maintain this check whether you want to you have to first, uh, you, if you want to load data into table B, then the key for the table should exist in table A. It's uh, similar to your fact dimension link, right? You're loading a particular key in your fact, but it doesn't exist in your dimension table. Then your data is not, um, your, your data integrity is not maintained. So that kind of checks is also done during your transformation. I think we discussed all this, decoding certain values from the source which I already talked about which is uh, in the coding form. Okay, yeah, so the same thing they are saying that uh, you can decode uh, the code values from different source system into descriptions of that code because the code values could be different in different uh, source systems for a certain column, but the description could be the same. So you first bring them to certain description format because your uh, reports 
are showing descriptions not uh, not the code values code values might not mean anything to the user so you might get the uh, you might want to transform the coded fields into uh, descriptions so that is a kind of transformations and also you might have to do different key generations for your data errors like generation of the primary key uh, running number so based on your data model so this is based we have discussed based on your sources what different transformations you can do this is based on the target data model you might your data model in the target might need new columns to be added to them so new columns uh, could be either aggregated values which we discussed second it could be sequence generated values where you are just generating keys for your dimension table or you are generating keys for your fact table something like that so hence these keys will be generated in your transformation flow so the example they are giving is that uh, in your transformation when you are trying to generate a key your incoming record so, so that uh, to load into your dimension you have to first get the max value of that key in your dimension table and increment one to it. So say you have five records, one, two, three, four, five in your dimension table. There is another record incoming into your uh, incoming from the source in your delta load. Then you have to first see how many records are already in your dimension. Say if, uh, so now you have five records, so you have to get that value, max value from your dimension and then increment one value onto it and attach it to your new record which is going into your dimension and then load the record. So this is another kind of transformation you have. So there are like hundred different kinds of transformation you can have based on your business scenario. So they are just discussing all the different kinds of uh, data transformations you have, uh, you can have in your ETL process. So the another examples, uh, there are a few more examples discussed. So in this slide, they are discussing about a company which is operating in different geographies this, uh, and they have different sources, different uh, metric system to keep their uh, data. So metric system, measuring system like in UK they follow UK standards, in US they follow US standards like in US they call measure weight in pounds, uh, I don't know, maybe in pounds and uh, in UK they are measuring the same weight in kilos and um, metrics uh, so there are different measuring metric systems right in this example they are taking two geographies so to bring all the me metric system into a single uh, system is also a kind of transformation bring it into a uniform so these are all examples of homogenizing the data in a certain format Okay, so the next process in our ETL is uh, uh, data loading. So the last uh, step in the ETL which is L, loading. So as we discussed in our previous slides about data extraction, we can read uh, data from source in two different ways. Either we read everything or we read only deltas which is incremental changes in your system. So as we know that reading everything is not always feasible, your OLTP systems could be huge. So you cannot always read everything, compare everything. So the second method as we discussed is more efficient method. So we take that example and see how data loading is performed uh, for incremental loads. So the example you see here, there is a person I uh, there, there are three columns in this table. There is person ID, date, and uh, state. So this data OLTP system actually is storing historical data. So see that person first on first of Jan bought three, uh, two products, uh, A4 sheets and pen, and the second person bought pencils. The third person bought uh, on second of Jan. Third person bought stapler. The first person on 2nd of Jan again bought notepad. So you can see this uh, OLTP system is storing all the data, uh, all the transactions which happened in that OLTP system. So now when you want to do incremental loads, there are many ways to do change data capture, right? So, so one way is to 
do it based on the date which we have here. So first time when we load initial load, you want to extract everything. So you start from a random date, say 1900-0101, and then you extract everything. But second load, say, okay, so 1900, anything greater than 1900, say today is 1st of Jan 2000. So you extract data from 1900 till 1st of Jan 2000. So you, all these records, first three records will be extracted. But the second, uh, these transactions are being performed. Today, as I said, is 1st of Jan 2000. So these transactions are still not in the system. So second time when you load, you check, get the data which is greater than your previous extraction date, which is 1st Jan. So you extracted on 1st Jan, you will extract now on 2nd Jan, which is, uh, you will extract only those records which are greater than 1st uh, Jan. So you will extract these two. And then on 3rd, you run your mapping again, your jobs again, and you will get data for 3rd Jan. So this is how you do it, uh, increment, you do your incremental load based on dates. There are, um, there are certain complications when you do incremental load. It could be that your job on 2nd Jan failed. Like in this example, they are saying your job on second gen actually failed to run. So you have to somehow have a data recovery method where you can find out whether your job which was run yesterday was successful before you can run today's job. Otherwise, you will skip those records which was yesterday's records, right? So you, you ran till 1st of Jan and your job failed. Then next day you just ran from 2nd of Jan. So you skipped all those records which were 1st of Jan transactions. So, so to avoid these kind of uh, mistakes, avoid this kind of data, missing data, you have to uh, maintain certain control tables. We call it, in general scenario, we call it control tables. The table you see here, which is actually storing the status of your operations, your data warehouse ETL operation. So your job, it has this control table here, is just a batch run status table, which stores uh, every batch runs status, say 1st of Jan successful. So if it is successful, then you run the 2nd of Jan with the current date. Otherwise, you have to somehow manage it to run it for the previous date also. So this Basically, you're just storing the status of your job and using that status to run your uh, run your next day job. And uh, also, this uh, in this example, they are showing one status is S and another status is F, which is failed. S is success. Third Jan batch is due to run next day, so it's D, whatever status. So if you, when you run your incremental load, you have to check if your previous load was success. This is one method to do it. Or you can actually have data recovery jobs. So as soon as uh, you have some failure in your job, there is a mail notification sent to, sent, to, you sent to the operation guy. He can go and check and then run it before the next load. It could also be another uh, way of handling these kind of data loading errors. So incremental load can have issues like this because your previous job failed. So, so these uh, recovery jobs, right, especially when you're doing incremental loads, it could uh, actually spoil your data in the data warehouse. So you have to have a proper recovery strategy so that you can, you can load, uh, you can continue with your next load. So, so that is about operate, operation, uh, operations of your data load process, day-to-day -day data load processes. So, okay, so there is a, the loading, right? So, why the loading, as I said, also determines how complex is your uh, data, uh, how complex is your ETL process. So, based on what system are you loading, whether it's a SCD, type 1 system, SCG type 2 and type 3 systems. I think we have, uh, I hope you guys remember, we discussed about these slowly changing dimensions, especially when you are do loading a data warehouse, you have dimensions, and then these dimensions could be CD type 1, 2 or 3. This is also, this also depend, decides your complexity of loading. So, CD type 1 is a simple 
dimension in which you just overwrite the old record. Type 2 is you uh, is a bit more complicated where you actually enter new record for any change that is happening in your dimension. Type 3 is where you have two different columns. So type 1 overwrite, type 2 create new record for updates, type 3 create new column for updates. So, so these are this uh, this accompanied by the incremental load can make it more complicated right so the so what i'm trying to say here is extraction and its recovery has to be maintained properly so that your integrity data integrity in your dimension is uh, in your uh, data model or your data warehouse is correct so the example they are showing here is of that scd type 1 and 2 so extract the incremental load, check if the exact match with the record already is present in the dimension. If there is a match, then ignore those records. Else, based on your type, uh, dimension type, you can either override the data or create a new record for type 2 or put a old value in a old column and new value, current value in a current column. So that's, that is about data loading. 